Good morning. Hello, it's good to see everybody. Glad you're all here. It's cooler in here than it is out there, amen? See, today, see, my job is so much easier on days like today because you don't have to give people just a visual of hell. You just have to say, go outside, and like you don't want to spend eternity like this. But So it just makes my job a lot, a lot easier. <laughs> I do have a couple of announcements for you this morning. First one you'll see over here on the screen. Uh, VBS, we're doing that a little differently, of course, this year, because everything is different this year. Uh, we are starting next Sunday, excuse me. <coughs> we are starting next Sunday, the 2nd, and that will be for five consecutive or successive uh, Sundays uh, in all of the month of August. So we won't be doing it in the evening. We'll be doing it on Sunday mornings during this time. So you, you, uh, please feel free to bring your children, bring your uh, grandchildren, and we will do it, like I said, for five Sundays in a row. You can see some of the decorations and the setup. Uh, very excited about it. Had a whole team in here all week, really working on that last couple of weeks. So very excited. So come on out for that. Bring your children, bring your grandchildren. Uh, Pastor Josh, do they need to sign up for this? Are we asking them to register online? Okay, please sign up. Okay, so you got a deadline now. See, I'm a deadline guy, so that works for me. Thank you, Ms. Chandra. Uh, sign up is Wednesday uh, to this week on the Internet. Call the office if you have any problems with that, and we'll get that straight for you. Uh, but very excited about very excited that we can do this, even during this very strange time. And I think the team has done a wonderful job of coming up with a good schedule and a good plan. So everybody will be properly distanced, and all of those safety issues uh, will be addressed. So come on out. Let your, uh, let your family know. So that's the first one. The second is that uh, Mr. Thomas Barlow passed away this past week. Uh, he was a longtime member of uh, this church, sang in the choir for over 60 years. It was 63 years, I think it was. Uh, it, it was He's just given uh, so much of himself, as that whole family has, to this church. So we want to honor him. Uh, tomorrow, his service, uh, Celebration of Life, will be in here at 11 o'clock tomorrow, interment to follow after that. Uh, so if you are able to come, again, we'll do all the appropriate spacing and the such to make sure everyone's safe. But if you're able to come, uh, please come and celebrate his life and uh, be here to support the family. That's 11 o'clock tomorrow. Okay. Any other announcements that I've forgotten? Visitation is today. Yes, at 2 o'clock, I believe it is. Uh, that's a student advance, I believe. Yes, that's 2 o'clock. Thank you for reminding me about that. That's 2 o'clock this afternoon. All right. If you have any other questions, you can come up to me after the service. You can catch his brother in the back. Uh, we have some information. We'll have the information for you. Any other announcements that I've forgotten this morning? All right. Well, let's prepare then, as we begin our worship, uh, to praise our Lord and to celebrate all that he has done for us and to praise his holy name. Allison, would you please prepare our hearts?
Uh, this morning, our congregational song is going to be Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Uh, we actually played this yesterday, uh, at, excuse me, at Lee Brown's funeral, a celebration of life that we had here. It's just a wonderful song. All of you will know the, the tune to Amazing Grace, uh, and then the chorus is added in, My Chains Are Gone. And friends, that is the hope we all live with, that that day is coming when our chains will be gone, that we will live without pain, we will live without worry or fear, uh, and we are called home. So amazing grace. Would you please stand and join us? You are forever. 
Please remain standing while we pray. To God in heaven, we do come to you this morning, and we do praise your name for that amazing grace. We praise your name that you looked down upon us in love, and you extended that grace through your plan of salvation. We just praise your name that you were so loving and so grace, gracious and so merciful that you looked down and chose to save us. And we praise your name. Lord, we cling to that amazing love. We cling to that amazing grace as we hold tight to the hope that we all have as we look towards uh, today, uh, the next month, the year, and the future that will be ours through Jesus Christ. May, Lord, you bless this time. May your spirit fill this room. May your peace be felt in each and every one of us. Lord, may you bring peace to our land. May you bring healing to our land. And may, Lord, may it start with us. We praise your holy name in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to do a song this morning that, you know, when Karen called us to play this song, or play a song this morning, we didn't know what we were going to do, and uh, so the Lord works in mysterious ways. Fluffy sent an email to Patsy and Carl the other day, and I read it, and in that email, she talked about Tommy, and she said that uh, now he's flown away. And she said, one day she fly away. I knew what song I had to do this morning. So. <laughs> Thank God for that. Amen. Our passage this morning is uh, James, still chapter 1, still 19 through 27. I encourage you to 
grab your Bibles and look at that with us. If not, we'll have it here on the screen. All right, James chapter 1, 19. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourself doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the, word, the world. And I must pray. To God in heaven, may these words teach us and grow us into the people you have called us to be. Bless this time together. May your Holy Spirit teach us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, friends, we're going to be walking through, as you know, the letter of James here uh, for several more weeks. And this uh, little passage here is kind of the segue to the rest of the letter. Now, we have looked at trials and how God uses trials to make us more into the people he's called us to be. And then we have looked at how out of those trials can come temptation, not from the Lord, but from our own desire to figure out a way for the trials to end and for a way to kind of overcome the trials in our own timing and our own ways. And so those are the first subjects that James has talked about. And now coming out of trials and avoiding temptations, we start to get to the very practical part of this letter. And in this section, he is kind of laying the groundwork for the rest of the conversation of the letter. There's going to be a lot of practical advice, a lot of how we actually live out our faith, uh, how we are Christians in the world. He's going to have a lot to tell us. And how appropriate that after talking about trials and the temptations that can come from that, how we can overcome that through the Lord, he goes right to what topic? Anger. Okay, and you see here in the very first verse of our section, let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Well, friends, those are words to live by right there. Because I can tell you right now, if we did those three things consistently, I would bet you that 90% of our interrelational problems would go away. Okay. I got an amen all the way from the back back there. All right. So if we were truly quick to hear, slow to speak, what would that mean would happen? We would actually hear what someone has to say, wouldn't we? And now you know communication is two-way, right? It's what I say. And then the piece we always miss, what the other person hears. And there is a vast gulf between these two, is there not? Because what I say, even if I say it well, even if I say it perfectly well, that doesn't mean you're going to hear it. I've done a fair amount of reading on emotional intelligence uh, over the last few months, and they make the point over and over and over again that our brain has so much to do with how we hear what other people are telling us. Because our brain is already processing it. 
The various parts of our brains are sticking it into files, is deciding whether it's a, an emotional response. Are we able to actually hear what the person's saying based on what our brain is churning into there? There's a, very, there's a whole science to all of this about how we hear and communicate. But then the additional thing I find that I'm always doing, and I imagine you probably do this too, when someone's speaking to me, I oftentimes have to get my brain to be quiet and stop thinking about what I want to say next. You ever notice that? Like someone's starting, blah, 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 blah. Like, oh, that's a good point. I got to say, blah, 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 blah. I got to say it quick because they might move on. I don't get my chance, right? And especially when we're having an argument, right? Oh, that's a good point. I got to nail him on that one. Hold on. Let me get it in there. Right? And don't we all do this? Okay? So we need to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and then slow to anger. And that's a hard one. That's a hard one. Because, again, our brain and our own sinfulness wants to to jump in the fray. We want to get this argument won. We want to make our point. We want to win this. We want to just level our opponents and wipe them out. It's like some kind of presidential debate, right? We want to just obliterate the opponent. But unfortunately, that's not the Christian way to interact with each other. When I have the opportunity to do marital counseling, I always tell them, and I always get kind of a strange look at first, but I always tell them, remember, when you fight, fight well. You know, it's going to be how you're doing right now, right? Because I don't mean like obliterate your opponent, obliterate your spouse, obliterate your, the person you're going to spend the rest of your life with. What I mean is fight in a way that is upbuilding to your relationship. Because, friends, look. I, I can say today, praise the Lord, 17 years ago, I said I do. Praise God. Okay? So the best thing that ever happened to me, and she's put up with me for 17 years now. Okay? But I attribute a chunk of that to the fact that we fight well. Because let's be honest, friends. If you spend any amount of time with one person, for any length of time, you're going to argue, are you not? Hey, it's inevitable. So the key to our relationship building is to make sure that we're fighting well, which means you don't say things like, you're acting just like your mother. You don't say that because that is unhelpful to the conversation. Okay? You don't argue in such a way as to tear each other down. You argue well to solve the problem. There's a group on the internet that does a bunch of YouTube songs and stuff. They're pretty famous now. And they said, their pastor talked to him about staying in Cleveland. That's what he calls, that's his tag for it, staying in Cleveland. And I've never, I've been to Cleveland once, so I don't mean to offend anyone who's in Cleveland or who's watching who likes Cleveland, but apparently Cleveland, I can only imagine, is a pretty lousy place in the middle of winter. We can probably all agree on that. It's cold, it's cloudy, it's snowy. And their argument from their pastor was when you're having an, uh, a dispute, even though the facts are difficult, even though the emotions are hard, you want to stay in Cleveland. You don't want to leave other places. You want to stay right there in the mess, in the uncomfortableness, in the difficulties. You want to stay with what is actually occurring. You don't want to run all over the place. You want to stay right in Cleveland where the difficulties and the uncomfortableness is. Because once you start flying all over the place, you become not quick to hear and not slow to speak. And not slow to anger. So, friends, this is this is imperative that we get these things right because they affect how we interact with each other. They affect how we live out our Christian life. This is extremely practical. The the ones you love that God has put in your life, you want to fight well, and you want to build up the relationship, not tear each other down. And how so much even more important is this in the church life? And I praise the Lord here. I mean, I praise the Lord that he put me in a place. Because we fight well. I mean, friends, we're Baptists. The only thing we agree on is fried chicken. Okay? All right? And we all agree on that. Okay? Amen to that. Okay? We all agree. But there are, let's say, 400, 500 of us that have an opinion about what we do here. And now with the 
the internet worship services and the world we live in. There's even more. We have people from all over the country and even across the globe who watch this service every Sunday. And so we have people plugged in from all, literally all over the world. And they all have opinions. We all have opinions. I have opinions. You have opinions. But the important part is, as we walk together as a church family in this congregation, in each other's lives, is that we fight well, that we focus on what needs to be done to follow the Lord and not seeking to hurt each other, not seeking to tear each other down, not seeking to win an argument, but to move forward as God would lead. And I praise the Lord that this church in the year and a half that I have been here has proven itself to do that over and over and over again. Because we have had meetings where we didn't agree. I know that shocks you. But when we get done with the conversation, I praise the Lord that we consistently, I mean consistently, praise God, shake hands, leave the room, our friends move forward, we worship together on Sunday and Wednesday night, and we praise God and we move forward. And friends, that is not the case everywhere. And God, I am convinced, God will not use an, an unhealthy church. And there are a lot of unhealthy churches out there. And I don't say that to condemn. I say that to praise the Lord that we have shown ourselves with the ability to move forward even when we disagreed in love. And it is imperative that we continue to do that, especially in this time. Because, friends, the only thing that isn't, hasn't changed, I mean, there's nothing that hasn't changed. I mean, look at all of you. I can't even see if you're smiling right now. Everything has changed. And it hasn't been a whole lot of fun, has it? But the only way that we, I believe, can guarantee that God continues to use us is to continue to be healthy. To continue to disagree in loving ways, to continue to move forward following God's ways in a very different, different and difficult world as he would lead us forward. Now, I'm not setting you up to announce like some kind of like major thing that's going on, okay? I'm not. I'm saying that it is such a blessing to serve with you, and it's such a blessing to be in a place that seeks to love on each other even when we disagree. And when you combine passages like this James passage with chapter 18 of the Gospel of Matthew, you see how God tells his people through his holy word to interact with each other. And it's in love, it's in compassion, it's in being slow to anger, it's hearing others before we speak. I mean, if we are to continue to be blessed by God, if we are to continue to be healthy and to be used by God, we have to continue to be the people of God, loving each other, even when it's difficult. Amen? And I praise the Lord that we have shown the ability to do that because it is such a blessing to me, to your staff, to your deacons, to your church leadership. Friends, this is not an easy time, and it's not going to get any easier. I mean, this coming week, they're supposed to come out and tell us what they're going to do in the schools. The governor gets up there at least, what, twice a week still. I mean, we don't know. But what is imperative is that we want to be the church that God is leading. We want to be a church that is used by God. And so therefore, we must continue to make sure that we are living the way God has told us to live. It's imperative. And we have to be slow to anger. Verse 20. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Unrighteous anger does not achieve the righteousness of God. A few months back, I was in the office with Chan, our office manager, and I, don't, I truthfully don't even remember what was going on. It wasn't anything major, but I remember fussing about something with her, and she looked at me and smiled and said, what would Jesus do? Thank you. To which I responded to her, what would Jesus do? I said, Jesus would flip some tables and bust them behind. That's what Jesus would do. <laughs> but the difference between Jesus' anger and mine is light years. Because Jesus can be angry in a righteous way. I seldom can be angry in a righteous way. 
okay? Because what happens when we get angry is, again, our body starts to respond, our heartbeat goes up, we start to sweat, we start to get anxious and aggressive, and before you know it, our legitimate anger, potentially about something, has now taken the step over the line which has gone from being righteously angry about something to acting in a very bad way. We say things we don't mean that we can't take back. We hurt people we don't want to hurt. We act in ways that are unbecoming and often childlike. And unfortunately, we end up acting a lot like my three-year-old when he doesn't want to take a nap or he wants a marshmallow. And unfortunately, our anger makes us behave in unrighteous ways. Now, hear me. This does not mean that anger in itself is the problem. In fact, Ephesians tells us just don't let the, don't, when you're angry, don't give the devil an end. Make sure that you are angry in an appropriate way. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. So this is not don't be angry, because you can't live in this world at some point and not be angry. You may be angry about the things we're seeing on the, the TV. You may be angry about things that are happening around our world right now. That is okay. And it is okay to be angry when you come to God. God is big enough for your emotions. What is not okay, the Bible consistently speaks against, is when your anger leads you to do unrighteous things. And it is a very, very quick trip, isn't it? from righteous anger to acting unrighteously. Now, God does not, praise the Lord, ever act unrighteously in his anger. And so we praise the Lord for that because he is not, as James already told us, he does not have sin. So do not let our unrighteous anger work against the righteousness of God. So we put aside our sin, verse 21, and James here calls this filthiness. All that remains of wickedness. Now, friends, I think sometimes we read over these things very quickly in the Bible. We get used to the language. We get used to reading it. Perhaps you've read James many times. And we miss these, these markers. Let's just call them. When we call sin filthiness, that has a very distinct point. Because in our society, as in most societies in history, we downplay sin. Oh, yeah, you know, I should have done that, but, man, I'm still a whole lot better than that dude over there. Oh, I shouldn't have said that, but you know what? I did better than my parents would have done. Yeah, 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 right? The problem with that is that we're comparing ourselves to other people. When in reality, we're called to compare ourselves to God's word and to Jesus Christ. You're not going to measure up. I'm not going to measure up. None of us are going to measure up. But the goal is to be more like Jesus every day. But passages like this, verse 21, when it reminds us that sin is filthy, that sin is an awful thing, it reminds us, I believe, that sin is not to be taken lightly. Sin creates eternal separation between us and God. And it's of our own choosing. It's of our own making. And God does not take sin lightly, and neither should we. Now, you know, we have these little white lies on things, and, and you know, we need all kinds of deep philosophical debates that we don't have time for this morning. But you understand exactly what I mean. When we downplay our sin, when we forget that it is a filthy thing, when we downplay it, we forget that God considered it so awful that he had to crucify his son to overcome its power. So anything that required that kind of response from God should not be so easily overlooked by us. Sin is a significant thing. It is something that is serious, and it's something that we need to take seriously in our lives and try to overcome in all areas. So 21 says, we've got to put it aside. And you need to humbly, understanding your position in all of this, humbly accept the word James says that God gives. And this is a word of salvation, friends. Receive the word implanted. The Holy Spirit has implanted the word of salvation in each and every one of us. And we have received that by becoming his children. And this word of salvation, this word implanted, is able to save your soul. Here's the danger for all of us. 
is not your salvation. That is safe in the hands of God. The danger is that we have merely listened and we are not actually living out our faith. So this connects to James, this anger leads into this conversation. Okay, if you can't control your anger, you need to recognize the sin in your life and you need to recognize that anger can lead into lots of other bad behaviors. And it may in fact be an example of how you or I are one of these individuals who hears the word of the Lord, but does not do the word of the Lord. We're called to be like the one who has been implanted the word of salvation, who humbly accepts it, and then does actually act on it. Friends, you do not earn your salvation. It has been implanted in you free of charge, grace, amazing grace. You don't earn it. But because of its work in you, James will argue throughout his letter that that should be evident in your life. Because of the word that's been implanted, it should be radiating out from you in all kinds of behaviors. But we're going to look at three in just a minute. The danger for all of us, the danger for the fat and lazy uh, Church of America, is that we have become listeners and not doers. We become hearers only. And friends, hear me clearly. Whether you're sitting in one of these pews or you're sitting at home, if you do not live out your faith, if that does not change your actions, your words, your emotions, how you live out your life, if your faith does not do that, then you do not have faith. Because the Holy Spirit cannot reside in you and not impact what you do. This is not about earning your salvation. You can't earn it. It's given you free of grace. But that salvation, if it is real, it will change who you are. It must change who you are. Because you have moved from a sinful, lost individual to an heir of eternal life and child of God. It must change who you are. Multiple pastors, big names, names you would know, have often said things like, of those who are sitting in our pews, 60 to 80% of them may not actually be saved. That is a very scary indictment. Because, friends, it does not matter how often you have sat in this pew. It doesn't matter what color your hair is, no hair, gray hair, whatever the case may be. It doesn't matter. Your spiritual health is not determined by your chronological age. Your spiritual health is determined by your relationship with Jesus Christ. You can sit in this pew, in this room, your entire life, and not be saved. Now remember, in other places the Bible will say, okay, you know all the answers? I've shared this with you before. I have, I have been in seminaries, and I have served with pastors who, they knew all the answers. You gave them a test, theology 101, 201, 301, 401. They could give you all the right answers. They could write them down. They could explain them. They could sound poetic in explaining them to you. But this knowledge up here had not impacted the knowledge here. This had not moved from being anything less than an intellectual exercise. Because, friends, scarily, you can make religion an intellectual exercise. I have seen it done, and I have studied with those who have. And it's terrifying. Because the world will gladly study religion, but that is not the same thing as the word implanted, friends. And so our call is to make sure that we are living as children of God, that we are being hearers and doers, that it is living out in our life. Do not be like this person. James gives us a little example of someone who gets up in the morning, looks in the mirror, and says, yeah, that'll do, and walks away. Momentary, very fleeting, just looking and moving on to the rest of the day. 
If you do that with your relationship with Christ, if you look in the mirror and say, that, that'll do, I'm good. And you go on and you live the rest of your life and walk the rest of your day, and that's all you thought about your relationship with God, if that is all the impact it had on you, there is a very real danger here. And James isn't fooling around. He's just laying it out there. And it's not my word, because I would never, I would never pretend to be able to say these things. But this is God's holy word saying that if you do, are this kind of person, you may be deluded. Chapter 22. I'm sorry, excuse me, verse 22. Deluded. Friends, no one wants to come up to Jesus whenever that day happens and find out they were deluded, do we? No one wants to do that. So we become doers of the word, not just hearers. All right, so moving on. We fool ourselves if we only hear, because that is not uh, a good barometer of our spiritual health. God's word of salvation should have a lasting impact on us. Don't be momentary or fleeting. Don't be like that person just looking in the mirror. So now, James, again, being very practical, gives us three examples of things that we can do. I like to be very practical. I like to do things. I like to be active. So it's very helpful to me when the word of the Lord says, okay, do this, boom, 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 boom. Say, I can handle that. That's good. I can handle it. So he gives us three things. He says, bridle your tongue. Okay, it's easy enough. I got it. Control it. All right, I got that one. I can handle it. Now, we're going to talk some more about this. James basically gives a chapter to this. And we're going to talk about this in a couple of weeks. If you can figure this one out, please come and counsel me. Because we can all use this one, can we not? And that, of course, goes back to the whole conversation about anger. When we get angry, we tend to cross that line between righteous anger and doing very unrighteous things. And we all do that. But James says, if you are a child of God, you need to be controlling your tongue. And he says something very strong here. If you do not, verse 26, you deceive your own heart. And, friends, I mean, James has come out pounding on us here. He says, your religion is worthless. That's how important... The Holy Spirit puts on James' heart to say, well, if you can't control your tongue, your religion is worthless. Now, when you look at this, this is not about curse words, friends. This is not about telling what we might call a body joke. This is not about the things that you might hear on TV that you don't like. It can include that, of course. It does include that. But it also includes a lot more. It has the Greek, it really indicates a lot more. It talks a lot more about lying about gossip, about slander of people, how we talk, how we interact. And again, this goes with my remarks from earlier about how I praise the Lord that these are not issues in our church, and I praise the Lord for that. But I have been in churches where gossip was rampant. And I have been in churches where mistreating each other with a tongue was a common theme. And one of those churches isn't open anymore. Because I don't think God can be fooled on this. So James says very clearly, if you don't control how you speak about each other, if you don't control what you say, who you say it to, and the way in which you say it, your religion is worthless. Again, it's not about earning your salvation. This is about God's word implanted, changing you from a sinful person into an heir of God, a child of God. And that word implanted should make your speech, what you say, how you talk, what you say about other people, that should be changed, albeit slowly sometimes. But that should change because of who you are now. If not, James says your religion runs the risk of being worthless. Friends, that is serious. There's no way to soften that up and be true to the text. And that's a challenge for all of us. So that's just number one. <laughs> number two is take care and have concern for the weak. In this society, orphans and widows were particularly vulnerable because of the way society was structured. Uh, if you were an orphan or widow, you often had no way of prepare, uh, providing for yourself, uh, taking care of yourself. 
So this verse, of course, James uses an example, but the larger piece of this is to care for those who are weak, to care for those who are downtrodden, to care for those who are marginalized, to take care of those who are hurting. This is something we need to continue to look at as a church. I'm so thrilled last year with our, our work with OCC where we gave boxes out to those who were underprivileged around the world. And there are other things with Orphan Voice in Vietnam. And there are other missions activities that are going on where we look to see both locally, state, uh, internationally, how we can help those who can use a gift and word uh, from the Lord. And so we continue to do those things. But we need to do those in our own life as well, friends. It's not enough just to say, oh, well, my church did that OCC thing, Lord, I'm in the good. No, what are you doing? What am I doing in my walk with Jesus Christ to care for, to show love, to support and strengthen those who are weakest? Uh, lots of organizations come to mind who are set up just for this thing. Uh, Compassion International, where you can sponsor children, and it's $38 a month. You can sponsor a child in some uh, difficult part of the world. That's just one of the many, many things that come to mind. And then, of course, there's lots of other ways that here, even in Smithfield, we can get uh, much more into the issues. We can get much more involved with people. There are lots of ways that God will give you the opportunity to help those who are hurting if you make yourself available. And for each and every one of us, that answer from God would be different. Each and every one of us might have a unique way to participate and help. But if your heart doesn't break for those who are hurting, then you do not have the heart of God. Because God's heart breaks when people are hurting. And ours should too. Number three, remain. Now, the translation of the New American Standard says uh, unstained. A better Greek translation for this word here in verse 27 is to remain spotless. To remain spotless from the world. Unstained by the world. And this is a hard one too, friends. I mean, James is not giving us easy things here. Control your tongue, help the weak, and remain unstained by the world. Well, the world is full of sin, friends. The world would love to drag you and I down. The world rejoices every single time a pastor has a moral failing. The world rejoices because they want us to be just like them. They want us to be lost on our sin. They want us to live without hope and peace, without safety and security. So we have to remain unstained by the world, which is easily said and is very, very difficult to do because That encompasses our entire life, doesn't it? That encompasses what you say, what you watch, who you hang out with, how you interact, perhaps what jobs you take, what career you follow, how you do in school, who you marry, how you raise your children, what you do in retirement, how you help with grandchildren. I mean, I go on and on and on. There's not an area of your life that the world isn't willing to mess up, right? So it is our call as children of God to remain spotless before the world, unstained by the world's influences. Will you and I avoid sin? No, we will not. And by the way, you can't legislate morality. All we can do as Christians, all we can do is to make sure We live it out and show it and show the world God's love and the light of the word. That's our call. It's our call to live what we say we believe. So that's it, friends. You live those three. That is the basis of pure religion. Now, let's be honest. We know that there's many others, but these are three that James gives us in a very practical way. If we could do these three... We'd be doing pretty well, wouldn't we? We wouldn't be perfect, but we'd be doing pretty well. So this week, your challenge is don't say anything mean to anybody. Go help a bunch of people and don't sin at all all week. And we'll check again next week and see how we did. All right? Okay. You're going to fail. And so am I. In fact, you may fail if I keep talking and you don't get out the door here. 
all right? Okay. But that is our challenge, friends, is to live like heirs of God. You are adopted. I am adopted. We are children of God. Don't ever forget that. You have been adopted and are an heir with Jesus Christ. And our friends, if that doesn't excite you, if that doesn't give you the energy to keep trying, even when we fail, then you need to have an honest talk with God. Because you are His child. And we just need to show the world what is so awesome about that. Amen? All right, let's pray. Dear God in heaven, we just praise your name this morning. And what an incredible honor it is to be able to be a child of God. I mean, it's such an honor, Lord, that we we don't even truly understand it. And our own sin and our our own issues keep us from even really being able to, to fathom what that even means in its entirety. But Lord, what we do understand about having the word implanted in us of salvation and being a child of God, what we do understand is so powerful and it's so full of love. And for me, it's just so encouraging to continue to get up when I mess up, dust myself off and try again, Lord. And so I praise your name, Lord, that you love us enough to to dust us off and get us set back on the right road. And let us be able to walk in faith with you and in love with you. So, God, thank you. And, Lord, for the times that we have failed, for the times that I have failed, for the times that we have have made the wrong step, Lord, in your abundant grace, mercy, and love, forgive us. Because our life, our, our background is riddled with sin, Lord. But you and your mercy have forgiven that. And so we once again come collectively and ask you to forgive us. Show your love to us by throwing our sins as far as the east is from the west. And bring us closer to you once again. And friends, if there's a sin in your life, if there's an area of your life, maybe it's uncontrolled anger. Maybe it's, it's words that were spoken in anger, words that were spoken unfairly to hurt others. Perhaps it was words to tear down another person. Perhaps it's something in your life. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's something where sin really has a hold on you. If there's an area of your life that you want prayer, if there's an area of your life you want to put right before God, I would encourage you to just, you can stay right where you are as we dismiss in a few moments. Uh, And we will speak with you safely. We will pray with you safely. If you're at home and hearing my words and there is some area of your life you want prayer for, I would just encourage you to reach out to us, contact us through various means there, phone number, uh, through Facebook, through email, just all kinds of ways to reach out to us. I would encourage you to do that. We want to pray for you and support you in this time. Because, friends, sin is filthy and it is powerful and it holds power over this world but it has been defeated we do not have to be controlled by it so Lord the scriptures say to search us to to try us so that we can grow closer to you so Lord I ask for all of us right now Lord that you would give us your eyes to see our life That we would see our life, our actions, our words through the eyes of eternity and see how they look to you. Friends, I challenge you. If you pray that to the Lord, he will make you more like himself. So Lord, we turn this time over to you. We praise your name that you have in fact saved us and that you do love us. Bless this time according to your holy will. May be as you see fit. In Jesus' name, our Savior's name, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn this morning is Living for Jesus. Please stand together as we sing as we go, Living for Jesus.
Amen. Uh, again, just as a way of reminder, uh, remember that uh, Thomas Barlow's uh, visitation is this afternoon. Uh, and his service of celebration of life will be here at 11 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, friends, I just want to encourage you to turn your life fully over to the Lord, to see where the sin uh, has a hold on your particular area of your life, and give that to God, because he loves you and he will help you overcome it. And so I pray that for you, I pray that for me. I pray that God will bless your week, guide you, direct you, lead you, show you his ways. In Jesus' name, let's pray. To God, we praise your name. We thank you as we prepare to leave this place. May it, do, uh, may it be as encouragement, may it be uh, as, as ready to take on the world for your name, for your plan of salvation, and to show your love to the world around us. Give us strength for the journey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.